Okay, can you hear me well? Okay, now we are switching from Spanish to English, or to Spanglish, maybe. I hope that you will understand my Spanglish, but welcome everyone, welcome to our American brothers and sisters who are attending this special class, and obviously all the uh, Latin American brothers and sisters. We're going to begin with a video, so I will ask uh, Tyler if he can help us playing the first video. Please, let's see it. America, in the past, present, and future. The United States has gotten increasingly diverse over the past 50 years. In 1965, the U.S. population was 84% white, 11% black, 4% Latinx, and 1% Asian. Less than 5% of the population was born in another country. And of the 535 members of Congress, just five were black, four were Asian, and four were Latinx. That means Congress was less than 3% people of color, and over 97% white. In the years that followed, waves of immigration changed the makeup of the United States. From 1965 to 2015, half of all U.S. immigrants came from Latin America, and one quarter came from Asia. As a result, in 2015, the U.S. population was 62% white, 18% Latinx, 12% Black, 6% Asian, and 2% other races. And about 14% of the population was born in another country. In 2016, 31% of eligible voters are people of color, the highest number in U.S. history. In Congress, currently compromising 17% people of color is the most diverse it's ever been. Still, as people of color make up 38% of the country, Congress remains conspicuously whiter than it should be. There's still a long way to go before the United States embraces all of its people. However, more and more Americans are embracing the country's growing diversity. 53% of Americans say immigrants strengthen the United States. 54% say they have a high openness to different cultures. And 57% say the United States' increasing diversity makes it a better place to live. In the years ahead, new immigrants and immigrants' children will continue to make the U.S. even more diverse. By 2055, no single racial or ethnic group will constitute a majority in the United States. Progress depends on diverse views and voices, and the U.S. is making new strides every day. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you for coming. What do you think of this video? A little scary? <laughs> so many foreigners one day on this land. Uh, I don't know, maybe for you as an American, this is something uh, very deep to think. What will happen with uh, this country in the future? Uh, the reality is that a lot of people is coming from a lot of countries, so that means that the Christian church should think about this. So that's the main idea about this class is not like a class, it's more like a reflection that I want to do with you. Uh, it is named Clothed with Christ, uh, Theological Meditations from the South of the Border about Race and Ethnic Diversity. My name is Arturo Lizarraraz. I am here with my wife, Ana Rosa, who is over here. Um, we are ministers in the Mexico City Church. I am an evangelist. She's a woman counselor. I am also the Bible teacher for the Mexico City Church, and we are very happy to be here with you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to share this time with you. So, I hope that you understand my Spanglish. Is, are you understanding everything? It's okay? Uh, I don't practice this often. I try to practice my English every day by praying in English. I pray every day in English, and I, I'm all, almost forgetting how to pray in Spanish. But then I, I need to return to speaking in Spanish the whole day until I pray again alone. So that's my way to practice English. So... Everything is based on Galatians 3, uh, 26 to 28, that says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God, true faith, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus. This is a very deep scripture. Very, very deep. Because in, in Jesus' time, uh, there were uh, some conflicts between the race issue. 
ethnic issue. You remember the Samaritans versus the Jews? They were real enemies in many ways. So in Jesus' times, this was alive. And the word that is used here from the Greek um, for clothes, it means uh, a sense of sinking into a garment, to invest with clothing, array, clothed with. It's like when the Bible says that we need to be clothed with Christ, it's like something should be put a new something new should be put on us, and we should wear that new clothes. It's like changing of clothes. When you change your clothes, you leave your old clothes in the floor or in, the, in every place, and you put new clothes. When we were baptized, the theological concept here is that we all start to use new clothes, the clothes of Christ. And when you have the clothes of Christ, uh, you don't see the difference with, between somebody with a Jew background or a Gentile background. There is no difference. When you have these new clothes, if somebody is a slave or somebody is free, there is no difference. You treat both the same. Uh, when you have these new clothes, no difference even if somebody is a female or a male. Uh, you know that also in these two very simple things, there is a lot of differences in treatment. For example, in Mexico, the women are paid differently than the men, only because they are women. So these kind of things in our society, uh, when you have the new clothes of Christ, you don't see any difference. Now change the names. Let's put, let's put white, Asian, Hindu, black, Latin, Indian. Is that a word for native Indians? Indian? Okay. When you are clothed with Christ, the teaching of the Bible is that we should see no difference between any race, any background, any social class, because we are all using and wearing new clothes. Does that make sense? So this, this sounds great as an idea. This sounds great as a, as a theological concept, but the, the hard part is to become this reality in the Christian church. So that's the point of our reflection today. Uh, I'm going to do several meditations, okay? Um, it's like reflections that I, were thinking, that I was thinking about this. And the first one is clothed with Christ means abandon racism. Literally, that is what it means. Why I say this? Let me talk a little about Mexico because the, the title of the class is Theological Meditations from the South of the Border. So I'm going to speak here from the all the Mexican countries that are from the south of the border. Have you heard that? All the Mexican countries in the south of the border? Well, <laughs> that's a joke. Obviously, there's only one country. There is Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Colombia, and there are not Mexican countries, okay? There is only one Mexican country. Well, but I will, I will try to speak from my country, from Mexico. Uh, do you know that we have lived also racism in Mexico? Uh, you can see this painting, it's a famous painting or a famous man that, uh, that was called Diego Rivera. It is named One Sunday in the Alameda. The Alameda is like the central park in the downtown area of Mexico City. Very old, very famous. Uh, in, in two centuries ago, one century ago, a lot of people went there, the rich people you see here versus the um, uh, poor people that normally well. The, the native population of Mexico, people who used to be Aztecs or Mayan or Olmecas or different cultures. So, yes, in Mexico, for many, many years, there were a division between uh, the Indians, the local native population, and more like the European kind of people. More the, the, the people that were uh, descendants from Spanish, more white more cultural, more intellect people, okay? We, in Mexico, we thought that it was something from the past until this news. Do you know her? She was nominated for one of the Oscars in the last, uh, in the last Oscars uh, ceremony. She, she's an actress from the Mexican movie Roma. And she was uh, nominated for the Oscar, is that the word? Uh, but the problem, is that uh, she 
is from uh, Oaxaca, that is a state in Mexico with a, a lot of uh, native population. They, they even don't speak Spanish, they, they, they know other languages more from their uh, ancient backgrounds. So when, when the people in Mexico saw her as a nominee for the Oscar, there were two reactions. Many Mexicans were, wow, it's incredible, somebody from Oaxaca now is in Hollywood, that is a big step for all Mexico. But there were some famous actors who were really angry against her. And they were saying, why this Indian is going to Hollywood? Not even me. I have never been nominated for an Oscar, but that Indian has not the right to be there. So we were scared. Even today, in our supposedly modern society, there is a lot of racism in Mexico. Uh, I'm going to share with you how was this seen in my life, in my past life. 2 Timothy 3 verse 2 says, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Maybe you remember this list in your uh, repentance study. Uh, when I was studying the Bible, I really thought that I was a good person because I was going to an evangelical church for nine years. I accepted Jesus in my heart for about 20 times. I went to the Holy Land, and uh, when I was in the Jordan River, the pastor of the church told me, you want to be baptized today? And I say, is that necessary because I don't have a towel or extra clothes? And they say, no, no, it's no need. You are safe anyway. So I didn't was baptized in the Jordan River uh, because I didn't have uh, new clothes for changing. But I was thinking I was a good person until I saw this kind of scriptures. And I started to see my life. I was very abusive against people who were different to me, maybe all of a low class society. I was very abusive against them. I was very critical. Uh, without love, I treated a lot of people without love, making fun of them, um, criticizes them. I remember I had some neighbors close to my home. They were uh, black in color in their skin, and I was very hard against them. All me and my cousins, we all very, very hard, attacking them, throwing things into their homes. Yeah, and my family was like uh, saying, okay, that's okay. I had no limit. When I studied the Bible, I saw this, and I felt deep pain of treating people in that way. I remember I was crying because I, I felt what, what, have, what I have been doing with my life, treating people without love. So I repented, I took the decision that I, I will not continue in my life treating people differently because they have different color skin, they have not the money that I have, or they didn't attend the school that I am going. So I changed it. But this was very painful for me. Very, very painful. And I am not blonde and blue eyes and all these kind of things. But in Mexico, uh, you can feel the classism and the racism only because of social position. I was studying in one of the best universities in Mexico, and I was watching even other students from public universities as low, lower than me, different than me. So I, I had a hard time understanding this, but then I understood and I changed. So later in my Christian life, do you remember the 2003? Our famous crisis? How was that for you? I imagine it was... A hard year, hard time. But in that time, I, I started, I went into a personal crisis. And I said, well, I, I know the official story of our church that uh, there would be disciples started on the Gempel's living room. And that's the point where the new church started. But I always, I always thought, I need to go uh, more deep than that. I want to know our real roots. So I started to do my own research and I found out more about the Church of Christ, the mainline Church of Christ. 
And I remember buying this book, Reviving the Ancient Faith, the story of the, inter of the Churches of Christ in America. I don't know if you have read this book. Very good book, very historical book. And I, I was trying to know, who am I? What is this movement? Uh, uh, what is the, the original root of this movement? And suddenly, I found this page that said, when leaders among Churches of Christ abandoned the apocalyptic vision following World War I and embarked on a program of systematic acculturation, most Churches of Christ no, not only failed to resist racism in the larger culture, but increasingly failed to resist racism within the church itself. So I started reading that there were black churches and white churches. But I don't know if you understand how was this for me. Because I was always thinking that this movement was the original, pure, and only Church of God. And suddenly I found that our root church has racism in the 60s. Black churches, white churches, I just couldn't imagine. Why, why is why that happening? It is supposed that we are Christians. Why, why black churches and white churches? I don't get it. So I understand in that moment that any church isn't the risk to fail under the temptation of blend with the local culture. And in that moment, start to sin and sin against other brothers and sisters only because racial issues. And that was very impressive to me. How does God may feel about this kind of uh, situation, about these things? James 2.1, my brothers and sisters, believers in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, there, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You can see in James, other scripture here, that he's very, um, very, very with a big conviction against favoritism, discrimination, uh, separation of brothers. And if you see the New Testament, when, uh, do you remember the, the moment when Paul, when Peter was with the Jew and then arrived at some Judah uh, from brothers from Jerusalem and then he, he returned with the, with the Jews and leave the Gentile and Paul was very angry and he rebuked Peter in front of everyone. So what I see in the New Testament is that every time that inside the Christian church there is favoritism, racism, discrimination of any kind, it's a big sin in the eyes of God. Really big sin. Apostles have a louder voice because of this issue. So it's not anything that that happens. So what, what my meditation was, if I am clothed with Christ, there should be no racism in my eyes. I come from that background in Mexico. I don't want to return ever to judge a brother by their color, by their social status, by their intellectual status, in a way. Because it's a sin. I understand that as a sin. So I need to be careful of my own culture. And you need to be careful both also in, in, your, in your own culture because this is a risk. Number two, meditation. Clothed with Christ uh, means resist the culture. Resist the culture. We like our culture, don't we? Our culture is, uh, we have been living in a country, in a city, and, and at the end, we end liking our culture. But the Bible says that we need to resist this temptation. Romans 2, 2, 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the question is, am I conformed or am I being transformed? In situation with the culture, we are in those, one of those two, two situations. Or I am being transformed 
evaluating my culture, taking the good, taking out the bad, or I am being conformed to my culture. I am becoming like my local culture. And that is not what God wants. So to, to do this, we need to develop what I call the need of the critical eye. We need to be critical with our own culture. Uh, there is a good book, A Christian Critic of American Culture. Uh, that sounds even strange, because to be honest, um, the American culture normally does not critique themselves. We, the Mexicans, are very good for that. We criticize us, we laugh about us, we do jokes about us all the time. But I don't find that in the American culture. In the movies, the Americans are always the good guys, all the time. <laughs> I don't remember a movie where the American is the bad guy and the Russian is the good guy, or the Vietnamese is the good guy. Always Americans are the good guy. So, we need to develop this kind of critical eye in our own culture so we can have the discernment of what things of my culture are good and are fine with my faith and what things I should reject completely because they are even sinful in nature. Okay? So that is very important. Thing. Okay. Uh, can, I, can we... <laughs> let's, well, let's, let's, let's play. No problem. In Mexico, there is one point. Imagine what requires to go from this point. You like dogs? Yeah? Imagine a lazy dog like this. What is needed to go from this point to this point? Can you play that again, please? Look. Thank you. <laughs> from this point to this point, okay? Is that easy? Let me do this question to the American brother. What do you think that requires that a lazy dog ends like a dancing dog? What do you think it requires? For Americans only. Mexican, say nothing. What do you think? Training? Maybe? Yeah? Maybe training, right? Well, in Mexico, we say, this is a popular saying, that the thing that is required is money. Because there's a popular saying in Mexico that says, with money, even the dog dances. So, that means that with money you can do anything. You can fix everything. You need a passport? Money. You need a visa? A fake visa, obviously. Money. You need a, a professional degree? You can buy it, too. What do you want? Bachelor, master's, doctorate? Everything can be done with money. So, <laughs> a lot of people in Mexico do, do, do this. With money, they do anything. Imagine a real Mexican church that has not rejected the sinful nature of their own culture. In Mexico, corruption is number one. You find that in every level. Corruption is a cancer in our society. Uh, we know that. We criticize that. We are not happy with that. And everyone in Mexico knows that our country is very corrupt. So imagine a real Mexican church, not just with tacos, enchiladas, burritos, not that. But imagine a real Mexican church will be a church when some disciple will say, hey, can I have a preaching opportunity? And I will say, okay, $100. And you got it. Next Sunday you preach. Or uh, another brother, hey, can I have a leadership position? Can I be on a staff? Can I be a Bible talk leader? Okay, $300. And we can fix that. Or some situation, hey, can I, avoid, uh, can I avoid discipline for sin? What kind of sin was? Oh, this or that? Okay, $500. And there will be no problem. I will say nothing. Can you imagine that kind of church? To be a Christian church? No, that will be a real Mexican church. So inside the Mexican churches, we need to fight all the time against corruption. All the time. And, and, and I have received uh, brothers who come, have come close to me and thinking that because I am an evangelist or a Bible teacher, I can help them in a special way to do something. And I say, hey, no, we don't do the ways like this. That is not right. But it's inside our nature to be corrupt, to pay money, to, to have... 
to find a way to, to do things more fast, more accessible, without any effort. That's a big problem in Mexico. But let me, please tell me, American brothers and sisters, what will be a real American church that uh, opens the door to their culture inside the church? Please describe me that. You, you can tell me. You know better your culture than anybody else. What will, you, what will be a real American church? Yes? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. White people leading and dominating the culture. What else? What else? A real American church. Perfect family. Wow. Okay. Like in the movies. Oh, everything fine. Good. Okay. Any, anyone else? Please. Okay. In the back. Oh, black people say. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good point. Okay. Good point. Okay. Please. Okay, okay. Prosperal, pros, uh, ma material prosperity. Very good. Somebody else here? Make no discussion of vulnerability or sin or weakness. That okay. That's all kind of hidden in the background. Okay. Uh, very superficial yeah. thing. Okay. So you know your culture. You need to be aware of uh, the failures of your own culture. Uh, be quiet. Because you will need all the time to fight against your own culture. So the church inside the church of Jesus Christ may not become an extension of your culture. But it should be really a difference. That's our fight in Mexico. Because the culture is very heavy. Corruption. And we need to be always on guard against that. So that's your job. You need to be taking care of your church so the culture may not go through that door and suddenly be all around us. Okay? Is that having sense to you? So that's another meditation that I have. Number three, clothed with Christ uh, means destroy hostility. Destroy hostility. Ephesians 2.14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that one of his goals was to destroy hostility between two groups, Jews and Gentiles. And that extends to all humanity. When Jesus died on the cross, his goal was to eliminate, stop, destroy hostility just because you and I are different and we have a long history of hostility. That doesn't work anymore with Jesus Christ. We need to stop hostility. Okay? Uh, do you know this guy? Yeah? Have you seen him before? <laughs> Rambo. Okay? Okay. Uh, I like Rambo movies, by the way. Uh, we have a Chihuahua dog in our home, and his name is Rambo. <laughs> uh, when I invite people to the home, I always say, uh, be careful with Rambo. So they imagine like a pit bull or, I don't know, something big, and a little, a little thing comes and wah, 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 wah. So it's very funny. But let, let me see how well you know your culture. Tell me, please, uh, who has been the enemy in each one of these movies? Because in each one of the movies, Rambo is always looking for new enemies. Uh, he's always in the search of a new enemy. Who was the enemy in Rambo 1? Do you remember that? Have you seen that? No? The sheriff. Okay, the authorities. Okay, that's right. Rambo 2, who was the enemy? Vietnamese and Russians too. Rambo 3? Russians, again, okay. <laughs> Rambo 4, who was the enemy? Uh, there was a di di dictator in a, in a Burma, I think, in a country with heavy, heavy discipline on the people. And, uh, and I think in 
Some days, five days, I think, it comes Rambo 5. Who is the enemy in Rambo 5? Do you know that? The Mexicans. We are the new enemy of Rambo. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, it was the Vietnamese, the Russians, now the Mexicans, we are the new enemy. So Rambo is coming to Mexico, okay? <laughs> well, but this is the reality, okay? More people in this country are starting to see Mexicans as the enemy. And yes, there are evil people in Mexico, but also in Guatemala, but also in Russia, but also in Africa, but also in China, because evil is everywhere. And here is evil people. Satan lives in this world. So there is evil people everywhere, but there, are, there is also good people everywhere. No? So we are starting to see things like that. Um, in Mexico, we see these things, and I, I, I couldn't believe this news. By the way, that day, three disciples of my region went to a mission experiment that, that we did in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. And that Saturday, because that was Saturday, they crossed the border, uh, and their plan was to go to that Walmart, specifically to that Walmart at the time of the shooting. Three disciples of my region. But they went late for something, as a good Mexican, it's always late. <laughs> so that saved them, because they were reaching the place, and they start to hear the alarms, the, the police, and they stop. And while that was happening, this guy was killing several Mexicans inside. So our government is trying to consider this as a terrorist attack. And they will try to, what's the word? To take this guy into Mexico to be judged. Extradite. As the chapel that is around here, I think, uh, he was extradited to the US. Now they, I know that they want to try to extradite this guy to Mexico. Imagine the hell that he will live in Mexico. Poor guy. It's, it, it will be terrible. I hope that he remains here, because suffering is waiting for him on the other side. But the problem now that I want to share from, from our perspective, the problem now that we have a lot of people, evil people in Mexico. I have been feeling a stronger and a stronger anti-American sentiment in the Mexicans, in Mexico. And that is very dangerous. We are, we are neighbors. So every time that some uh, crazy racist here in the US treats bad some Mexican, or there, you will find always people taking videos. That video goes to the internet. That becomes what they call viral. And when we, the Mexicans, see that, there is like an anger in us. Uh, talking about my race, uh, people is getting angry. And uh, I remember. Um, once that uh, uh, we brought to Mexico one um, professional counselor from the U.S. and the brother that sent that brother also sent me to a, a couple of uh, bodyguards, American bodyguards, uh, with SUV, black SUVs and equipment and everything. And the first day they arrived to Mexico because they were uh, driving like in a convoy. Police surrounded them, uh, about 12 police cars with guns. And uh, the Mexican brother who was with them was trying to say to the police, hey, wait, wait, they're Americans, treat them well. And the police were saying, no, they treat us bad over there. Now they will pay here. And they were thinking, really <laughs> doing terrible things to them. But the brother were, no, wait, wait. And at the end, nothing happened to them. He was, one of them was an expert in martial arts. The other was had a, a gun a gun shop and was an expert on shooting. Uh, the, the next day, they were too crying because the police were very harsh with them. They wanted to return to the US. They were discouraged. So I was trying to uh, encourage them to continue their job. And it was very funny for, for us, but for them, they were living a hell. But I am finding that in our society, this is growing. So we have evil people, crazy people with a lot of guns and we don't want to see that one day Mexico can become like an Afghanistan for Americans. Uh, so we need to be careful. Because in the way that we take care of our society, in the way that we treat with respect other people, uh, that way we will avoid innocence to die in other places. So I'm a little scared about this. Because I'm watching in this society. It's getting angry. Meditation number four. 
Clothe with Christ means practice hospitality. Practice hospitality and empathy. Hebrews 13 says, uh, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated uh, as if you yourselves were suffering. Two words that this scripture has for us, hospitality and empathy with those who suffer. Okay? Mexican hospitality. Have you been in Mexico before? Who have you been in Mexico? Which, which city have you been? Mexico City. Okay, what else? Ensenada. Juarez. Okay, more to the north. Anybody has been in Cancun, for example? A paradise? A paradise in the world, Cancun, Puerto Vallarta, Acapulco, beautiful places. But one thing that is very good of our, our culture is hospitality. Uh, when, I, when American Brothers goes to the U.S., these are pictures of what, what we do with them. Uh, we take them to the pyramids, uh, the Teotihuacan pyramids, very far away from Mexico City. We take them to the Zocalo and visit all the things and eat really good food. We take them to restaurants. We take them to have a trip on downtown. Uh, we give them a hotel with them, hospitality, houses, food, anything that we can. We don't let them even walk in alone in the street. There is always a Mexican with them, taking care of them, checking them, being with them. Even until late night, they say, oh, no, George, go home. No, no, no. Until you are in your hotel room, I'm fine. And at the end, we leave. So what I'm trying to say, uh, the Mexicans, we have a lot of hospitality to foreigners. I cannot imagine finding an American person in the street speaking in English, and suddenly a group of Mexicans around, hey, why are you speaking English? This is my country. You need to speak in Spanish. And in Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, because you are in Aztec territory. I just can't imagine that. I have never seen that in all my life. Not in the worst moments between the Mexico and U.S. relationships. We treat foreigners with hospitality all the time. All the time. That's something very, very Mexican. And I have here a very close example of Mexican hospitality. Agustin and Erika, they have been incredible hosts for us. They uh, have tones of hospitality and generosity in their hearts. It's amazing. Uh, but that is how we, the Mexicans, are with the foreigners. So why I say this? Because of this. When, when, when we talk about the illegal aliens, we in Mexico think about this. Illegal aliens, for us it's like an E.T., illegal E.T. without a visa. So that word sounds crazy because for us, Alien is that movie of the 80s. You remember? Alien. Uh, for us, when we hear Alien, we relate that to that movie and say illegal aliens. But the reality is that there are a lot of Central American and Mexican and South American suffering because of, you know, the illegal situation. But their suffering is going, I think, uh, very far away, separating families. Uh, children have died in, in, in places where the government is taking them, separating from their parents. Uh, people is crying because they, they separate their children. Uh, it's terrible. I know it's illegal what they are doing. I am clear of that. But they are suffering. And what is the call of Hebrews 13 for us as a Christian? You remember that? Two words, hospitality and empathy. And especially it says, have empathy with those who suffer. I remember one of my visits to La Habana, Cuba. We have a church there in La Habana. Have you been in Cuba before? Okay, it's a very interesting country. It's like returning on time 50 years ago. Uh, but we have a church there. And I remember one of the brothers, I was recording on video some testimonies. And one of them, he was saying in the video, uh, he was reading the scripture of Hebrews 13. And he said, church in Mexico, 
remember us. We are suffering. Just don't forget that we exist. Think on us in our suffering. And we can say, oh no, that's what you wanted. You want the communists, you want the Che Guevara. That's your problem. I don't care. It's not my case. But his call was very genuine. Please think on us. We are suffering. And that really touched my heart. And I was thinking, we need to have empathy with those who suffer. So American brothers, I know that there are some uh, Latin American disciples who are illegal. In every church that I visit, I found those illegal aliens, Christians. Uh, we are not the authorities. We are not the one who is going, oh, you need to go to jail. You need to go to the police. No. Our call is just have empathy. They are suffering. They have our wills in the fear of being deported. They are in pain. So our job is only have empathy and show love. And that's all. The rest, we have authorities for that. And at the end, God is the final judge. But it is not our role to be the police or the army or the Navy SEALs or the Green Berets. That is not our role. You leave that to the authorities. You only show empathy with the legal. And finally, clothed with Christ means sacrifice yourselves. And I end with this. 1 Corinthians 9, 20, 9, 19 says, So I am free and belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those not having the law, to the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people, so that, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all these for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You know, Paul's heart, I am all to all. I am not Jew all the time. I change. I switch. It's like a shape shifter. I am with the Jews, I'm Jew. I'm a Gentile, I'm a Gentile. So that's, I don't know if you have been a missionary. Have uh, any of you have been missionary to other countries, other cities? Okay, we have our Ma Bar Moyers, one of the original team members in, a, in the Mexico City Church. I, I saw them. I saw them when they arrived trying to speak our language. I saw some of them saying funny Mexican things. Uh, trying to speak our uh, slang. I remember some of them trying to do things in Spanish that at the end were other things. That was very funny, but I saw their effort to win us, to become like us, listening to our music, music that I don't even like, and they were listening to that music. And I said, why are you listening? Why don't you listen country or rock? No, 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 I want ranchero. I want... Uh, um, uh, this guy who died, Juan Gabriel. I like Juan Gabriel. Let's put Juan Gabriel. But I saw their effort. When you, are, when you have the mission in your heart, you become all to everyone. So I have a word for my Latin brothers and sisters here. Are you here, Latinos? <laughs> I want to tell you something. Because also we think this in the south of the border about you. You need to respect the laws here. You cannot treat the police here like you treat that in your country. I was in L.A. a few years ago. We were in a conference. Uh, we, we were hungry. We were four Mexicans. We have a rental car. So we got out of the university about 11 p.m. We couldn't find anything. Uh, so we end in Santa Ana, California. I saw a lot of Mexicans' homes, and I told the brother, let's get out of here. This is going to be heavy. So we were turning around, and the police arrived. They stopped us. And the brother who was driving, uh, he tried to get out of the car. And we all say, hey, don't you see the movies? You cannot do that. Stay here. Remain here. Don't do anything. No, no, no. I need to go to the police because we do that in Mexico. He just tried. And I saw a hand, boom, he hit his chest and a gun in his head. And the other gun in my head. For five minutes, these two police officers with guns, they were saying, you want to kill me? You want to kill me. Or you are drunk, or you want to kill me. And at the end, we said, no, we're just lost tourists. And uh, I'm sorry, we didn't know that we should not get out. Oh, well, in this country, you should obey the law. And we learned a big lesson <laughs> that day. So if you come to this country, you need to respect the law. 
You need to respect authority. You need to treat them with respect. Because that's the culture, and that's a very good culture here. Also, you need to learn English. That's, that's the need, because you live here. That's the only reason. You cannot continue saying, oh, no, I will never stop being a Mexican. I will never stop being in my country. I will never learn that language. No, you are here, and you are a Christian. And you, you need to think as a missionary. If you learn English, because of you, some American families can be saved. But if you cannot speak with them, nothing, how are you going to save them? So it's have like a mission mentality, become everything where you go. So I challenge you to learn English and I stop complaining because things are not in Spanish. You learn English. And if you have something in Spanish, that's good, be grateful, but that is not the goal. You need to learn English. Am I right? That's what we think also in, in Mexico. And also, you like to, to, to like American sports. <laughs> oh, no, I only like soccer, and that's all. I don't want to know any American football or baseball. But I know that here, the American sports are very famous, very popular. So you need to like those things to become like everyone. Why? To save them. To Bring salvation to them. That's the only thing. I was a missionary too in Querétaro. I went, we went there and we were trying to eat what they eat and play what they play and be like them. Why? To win them for Christ. And if you are living here, a foreigner, then you are a missionary. You need to leave the mission. This is your mission for you because you are the foreigner. So that's what I see your situation. So, that was the class. I hope that you understood me. Thank you for listening, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you.